Hey, Anne, welcome to the Open Door Sisterhood. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so fun to have you. And so talk to us a little bit about what your morning looked like. Oh, well, I know that they say there's no such thing as a typical morning, but this morning was far from typical. I woke up at six, which I was really excited about because it wasn't four like yesterday. I've been on book tour. This is my, it's supposed to be a relaxing week at home. It's not, it's been one of those things, but not both. Four, wait, are we four o'clock? In the morning. It was an, it was an accident. I just, I think my body clock is all jacked. Yeah. It feels messed with and it's protesting. So I slept till six. I was really excited about that. Um, I have four kids that this morning were going in three different directions. So it could have been mm-hmm. worse, but not by much. But we had, <laughs> I was at the dentist at 7.55 a.m. And then there was a meeting at school. And then this is a very unusual morning. Um, people from my publisher that Alex may know are in town. And so we had coffee in my house. Mm -hmm. which is kind of a disaster, but you know, I I believe in being open and real with people and it was real around here this morning. And now here we are. Well, that's a lot of stuff in a few hours. 9 a.m. I mean, often I drink two cups of coffee and walk the dog. I mean, just very chill. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I'll burn a bagel, but no, this morning was weird. Yeah. Well, so tell us about your book tour. Where have you been so far and where are you going? Ooh, um, I feel like I've covered no ground and tons of ground all at once. When you plan a book tour, you really realize that the United States is awfully big and spread out. So I've been to Chicago and St. Louis, lots of places in the Carolinas. I've been to Asheville and Charlotte and Davidson and Winston-Salem. I went to my first literary festival, which was lots of fun. Went to this tiny children's, uh, no, not tiny bookstore, tiny town, Monroe, Georgia, with an awesome and large children's bookstore called The Story Shop, stopped in Athens, uh, went to Atlanta, but just to the airport. And is that, all? no, and then I went to Florida. Can't forget that. Went to Tampa and this adorable little town outside Orlando called Mount Dora that was really lovely. It was like an old fashioned New England town, but with palm trees, which was a little jarring, but <laughs> completely awesome. And I'm getting ready to go to Texas, Denver, and the West Coast and Brooklyn. All on the same trip because I'm in Louisville and that doesn't exactly make geographic sense, but it makes scheduling sense. And sometimes that's how it works. Texas and Denver make sense to me, but Brooklyn on top of that, that's, you know, while you're on the Northern part of the United States, why not hit Brooklyn? (laughs) I'm going from San Francisco to Brooklyn. Happy to do both. Not excited (laughs) about the long flight. I was super excited when I saw your Denver stop because it's my neighborhood bookstore. Is it like really? I can walk there. The only problem is I'm going to be at a soccer tournament, but I want to talk to you about that later. About- I understand the real life factors that yeah. go into such things, but it's book bar is such a great place. I just went mm-hmm. for the first time last summer when I was in town for my husband's family reunion and it wasn't in Denver. It was down in monument, but we made time mm-hmm. to get good coffee and go to a couple of bookstores. And I just loved it. I'm jealous that you're local. Yeah. Well, now you know my neighborhood. It's right smack dab. In right. my neighborhood. Let's I'm going to need some eating recommendations. Okay. I hear there's a great place across the street, but I've got time for more. Okay. Okay. So, Anne, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> Since we discussed how to pronounce it, I feel a little self-conscious. But when I wish to be understood by those who do not live in the region, I usually pronounce it Louisville. And nobody bats an eye. Where I say Louisville and they go, huh? Uh-huh. So your is your family still there? Extended family still there? And you grew up there and you've stayed or did you leave for a while? I grew up there. I left for school. We came back when we um, got married and had kids. So I haven't been gone long. It's, I feel like it's not a sexy place to live, but it's a very livable place with just the size and the parks. And now that we have a Trader Joe's and a couple of, um, you know, a Trader Joe's and a Sephora. That was big when we got those two things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just cover all your bases. Um, it's a little hot right now for my taste, but it'll cool off soon. We'll have a uh-huh. lovely winter. Okay. So I'd love to hear how you got started writing and what that journey looked like for you. Oh, okay. I think the question is writing what? Because, I mean, I know what you mean by the question, but before I started writing on my blog, Modern Mrs. Darcy, uh, I wrote legal briefs. And that 
is a different thing. When people like wax poetic about their writing life, they're not talking about boundary line dispute exposition. <laughs> right. As important as that may be sometimes, especially if you're in a current line of work. Um, I didn't write with the intention of anyone reading it until I did start a blog in 2011, which I felt for a long time I was a brand new blogger. And I can't say that anymore because in blogging years, right. um, yeah, that ma- it's like dog years. That's not new anymore. Totally. And I feel like you're a legit blogger because you blog regularly. (laughs) (laughs) She says in the middle of book tour. (laughs) You have a blog that is active and you send things out quite frequently to your readers, unlike some of us. So I think you're a legit blogger. Well, here's what I would like to say to uh, some of us is that when I started and in 2011, it was really important to me to blog regularly because I thought that would look like I was taking it seriously and it would look professional. I also know just for my own sake, because I, I wanted it to, I wanted readers to know that they could trust that words would appear on a regular schedule. That was important. But also for my own sake, I knew if I told myself I could do it anytime, that would become no time. I just really needed that routine. However, seven going on eight years later, I don't feel like that at all anymore. I feel like the internet has changed so much and I don't actually want to be perceived as professional. I don't want to be mistaken for a magazine. I'm a person and I really like sites that seem like they're written by actual people with actual lives, not just some you know, some content machine or just some anonymous writer. I want to be me. And so even if some of us aren't blogging regularly, I really, uh, I really admire like when people show up or don't because of their real life and with their real selves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means not blogging for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So I hear what you're saying. And yet I, I do appreciate like the, the openness and honesty about what it's really like and the fact that posts are authentically written by actual people. Have you always been into books? Like when you were a kid, were you one of those that would just like all day stay in bed and read? Yes and no. I have definitely always been a reader. Like I have this really embarrassing memory of the principal coming to my third grade class and calling me out in front of the class and saying like, yes, you read 87 books on summer reading because (laughs) I have a very, I don't know, trusting, naive kind of personality. I don't really love this about myself, but it is definitely true. So, and I'm very earnest. So when we were giving the summer reading log and we're told to write down everything we read, I didn't realize that maybe I should write down a certain number or the assignment was to write down what you read and then you turn it in, you get called out in front of the class and that's super embarrassing. So looking back, (laughs) I'm very grateful that my eight-year-old reading life wasn't just squelched right there. And I thought, oh, this is just, this is not good for for anything. I'm not going to do this again. (laughs) But so I was definitely reading a lot, but I was not, I don't know. I remember not wanting to do anything for days because I was in the middle of a great book, but I don't feel like I was always the kid who was like in the creek with a book whose mom couldn't find her or reading under the table um, Mm -hmm. for dinner. And then did you study writing in college or what did you know you wanted to go down that path? No, no, not at all. I, I remember really enjoying a few um, English literature classes. I took this class when I was 19. I might've been 18. It was my freshman year at college and I have a late birthday, but it was a seminar at William and Mary. It was called writers on writing. And I remember meeting um, Annie Dillard totally blew my mind. Donald Hall. Oh, I can picture one of the other textbooks, but, but the course was, which I didn't realize what writers on writing meant, honestly, when I signed up for it, when I was a senior in high school at my kitchen table, like looking through the actual paper course catalog, (laughs) because I got old somewhere along the way. I didn't, realized that it was going to be writers discussing their own work and discussing their writing life. But I just thought that was fascinating. And yet I was really drawn to um, the question of why people do the things they do and how um, those things can be shaped. So I was really drawn to um, like poli sci or sociology or education, which is what I finally ended up pursuing. Not that I used it a day of my professional career. I mean, of course I used it. Because you can't, you know, you, you learn what you learn and it becomes a part of you, but Mm -hmm. nobody ever went, Oh, it's a good thing. She has that degree for this job. 
<laughs> I was afraid to pursue literature because uh, some older friends had told me the dangers of uh, becoming an English major. You think that it's just going to draw you deeper into the books you love, but actually it makes the books you love a whole lot of work. And looking back, I don't know if that was the right call or not. It was the call I made and I'm okay with that, but I was very leery of uh, ruining that relationship I really felt I had with with my books that I loved. I didn't want to ruin it by becoming an English major. And so when people said, you got to be careful, I apparently took that really seriously. Right. I was an English lit major. So there you go. And how did that work um, out for you? Well, um, I would say there was some truth to that, but I really did enjoy my major mm -hmm. all the way through mm -hmm. because I love talking about ideas and concepts and mm -hmm. history and context. And, you know, so I... I really enjoyed the classes and because mm -hmm. Alex and I actually went to the same college and it was a small liberal arts and so the classes were small. And so we would just get in these really deep, rich discussions. And that was my whole major was deep, rich discussions pretty much the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. sounds pretty great to me. And you probably graduated with a much shorter list of books you wish you'd read by mm -hmm. now, where I graduated from college and felt like I was making up for all the books I hadn't read in high school and college. I still feel like I'm making up for those. Right. Well, you're sure getting some traction, Anne. <laughs> I finished a book last night for the first time in like three weeks, which is I totally par for the course for some people. That's mm -hmm. usually for me, like three days is a long time. <sighs> book tour is so weird. You must so. be like an ultra fast reader, reader because I'm looking at your life mm -hmm. for kids a full schedule, a book tour, you're trying to write and you're reading and you're producing mm -hmm. all of these book lists. And I mean, give us a little window into what that looks like for you. Are you just like crazy fast reader or how do you fit in time practically? Mm -hmm. oh, well, I have a couple of things going for me. Um, my unfair advantage is I am a naturally fast reader. I'm not a speed reader. That's something else. Um, I don't take in four lines at a time. I don't skip words. <laughs> But I am naturally fast. I'm a really slow runner naturally, though. So I'd like to think that it balances out <laughs> somewhere. Um, another, uh, another, I don't know if this is a disadvantage or an advantage. Another truth is that I'm an introvert who spends a lot of time uh, with people and socializing. And I got to recharge by spending time alone. And my favorite way to spend time alone is walking the dog or reading good books by myself. So between those two things, the naturally fast, the got to recharge my batteries. And I do like when I, when I don't have a highly unusual schedule, I do have reading chunks of time built into the rhythms of my life. Like I usually read for a little bit in the afternoon, uh, which has fallen by the wayside lately because it's been bonkers around here, but a little bit in the afternoon helps me just like take a deep breath and move on with my day. But I love to read before bed. It's how my body knows, okay, we're winding down now before we shut off for the night. Mm -hmm. Which I hear is just something we need to build in because those of us that are looking at screens until we go to bed, our bodies don't think it's time to wind down. So it's like the lost art almost of reading in bed with the bed <laughs> like, that'll preach yeah it um so how long do you read before you go to sleep do you read like half an hour or how do you know when it's time to close the book and close your eyes oh well i probably usually close the book a little bit after i know it was time to mm -hmm. if i'm reading something good um even if it's late or i'm tired I hate to go to bed without reading at least 10 pages because one that, I mean, that book's not going to read itself and those like five, 10 page chunks add up. But also that is a really important transition time for me. So I always read a little, but uh, 30 to 60 minutes is my preference. Mm -hmm. and you know what? I often read a little bit like right before dinner or if, if I'm making a kind of dinner or if my husband's making dinner, I can read that happens in my house. But if I, may, if I can just start something, like put something on the stove or in the oven or on the grill and then read for 20 minutes, that's something that I really love around the uh, transition from afternoon to evening, like from well, all I the like, things to quiet at home. Yeah. And you're modeling reading for your kids even when you're, I mean, they may be running around you or whatever um, while you're reading, but I love that. They're seeing you reading a lot. 
Uh, yes. Some days I think like, yes, I'm doing a great job modeling for my kids. And some days I think, oh, we can, I can just make up all the excuses I want to, <laughs> to do what I would really prefer doing. No, but the research really does show that when there are books in the home and people reading them, that does wonderful things for everyone's reading lives, especially, uh, especially kids of any age. Does your husband share in his love with you? Like, are you able to have read similar books sometimes and talk about them? Does he join in? He does. He's not been obsessed like I was. In fact, I talk about him in my new book, I'd Rather Be Reading. There's an essay called Hooked on the Story, where I talk about um, how many, many people who are passionate about their reading lives can trace that love back to the one book that made them realize the power of great literature. Although great literature might be a misnomer because I talk about my husband in that chapter and his book was The Firm by John Grisham. <laughs> yes. And he was 17, which is kind of old, but you know, people come to reading at all ages to really appreciate like why it can be, um, you know, fun and enjoyable and a good use of time to read a book instead of all the other things you could be doing with your time. But when he was 17, he had previously, you know, read half-heartedly because people had made him basically, but he picked up the firm because somebody recommended it to him and he just couldn't put it down because he wanted to know what happened next. And he closed it and was like, I didn't know reading could be like that. And that was a, you know, that was a big light bulb moment for him. But now he's always been a reader. So we've been married forever. We got married right out of school. So we're going on 18 years. No, we already had 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> so we're coming up on 20. So see, we really are old. Uh -huh. But just last winter, he was saying, you know, it's so funny. Like we've been married forever. I've been reading a long time, but I am finishing the best reading year I've ever had. Like uh, more books, more books I really enjoyed. We do read a lot of the same stuff because we can talk about it or he'll, he'll hear me talk about it and he'll say, well, I like that. And sometimes I say, yes. And sometimes I say, well, but yeah, he has been on a roll lately. And I don't want to imply that uh, quantity is the goal by any means, but he wanted to make time to read more because that was important to him. And he did in part because he had so much to read that he was excited about reading. And many people, if they have something they're excited about reading, they can make time to read mm -hmm. a little more every day. And that's really what he did. That's awesome. Okay. So talk to us about your new book. So um, where do you go in this book and where do you take the reader? Oh, my new book is I'd Rather Be Reading, and the subtitle is The Delights and Dilemmas of the Reading Life. And it's dedicated to anyone who has ever finished a book under the covers with a flashlight when they were supposed to be sleeping. An inscription that's gotten me in a little bit of trouble with my parents. Like, really? How much did that happen when you were little? <laughs> yeah, right. like, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm older now. But it's a book for those of us who don't think that reading is a hobby or a way to pass the time, but a key part of our identity. It's for those who believe that our books um, define us and shape us and um, reflect and affect who we are as people. And in this book, it's wistful. It's a little nostalgic in places, but it's also funny at times. And I hope always, always relatable. And I talk about things like we were talking about earlier, like, um, the the night that I realized that there's Sweet Valley High and I love those and there's the Babysitter's <laughs> Club and I love those too. But then I read Emily of New Moon, which was the first book I finished under the covers with a flashlight at two o'clock in the morning when I was way too young for that to be okay. The 2 a.m., not the book. And when I finished it, well, first I thought it was amazing, but I recognized that it was different mm -hmm. than Sweet Valley High. Right. <laughs> that it was a book I loved, but I could also see that it was on a different level. And it really meant something to me as a reader. And then I talk about uh, growing up and how the first house of my adult life happened by pure coincidence or maybe destiny. I don't know. But, but it happened to be next door to a really awesome public library. And when we moved in, we were like, oh, this is fun. And when we moved out, I cried because he wants to leave the library next door. Oh, I know. And then... 
a little over a year ago, my family moved into a new house and I finally got my bookworm dream of wall to wall, floor to ceiling bookshelves, which was amazing. But then I had to figure out how to organize the bookshelves. And I know that many people think they're just books. You just throw them on the wall, but readers know that there's a lot involved here. Like you right. have to decide, like, do you do it by genre? Do you do it by color? Which I know made a lot of people gasp. Do you split up the paperback and the hardcover? And what do you do with series? And do you keep the books you haven't read separate from the ones you have? And uh, my friend organizes by Trivial Pursuit category, which I think has a lot going for it. And wow, there are certain people who obsess over these decisions. And they are book lovers of a different caliber than the people who read, you know, four books a year and they're still above the American average. So it's a book that reflects all those different aspects of their reading life. And I... Okay, but wait, that was a nail biter. <laughs> what did you end up doing? How did you organize your books? Well, I can tell you what I did, but I'm thinking about changing it, Krista. Oh, so okay, okay. <laughs> I have my hardcovers and paperbacks split. The fiction is alphabetical. The nonfiction is loosely by genre, but I'm thinking about going... Dewey Decimal, which I didn't think I was that big, like a control freaking nerd, but I might actually be. But then I have all these special shelves. Like there's an essay and I'd rather be reading called My Inner Circle, where I talk about a special friends and family shelf I have, even though I don't have much in the way of family that writes books, but I have authors that feel like family or feel like friends. So Veronica Mars is weirdly on that shelf, but um, so is Madeline Langle, but also all the many real life people I know who are writing books. And because I'm a writer, that circle has gotten wider. And I talk about how the act of creating that shelf has really changed the way I interact with the books I read. And I have some special shelves of books that are beautiful. Like I have tons of Jane Austen's. I have a whole bunch of children's series that are really pretty. And there's this one color of book that I really especially love. It's this kind of oceany green blue. So I have a whole pile of those that are so okay. good. I collect orange penguin paperbacks, the kind you can get. Oh, like these. Oh, the yeah. Kind yeah, that yeah. You can get at used book sales for a dollar or 50 cents if you're lucky on the last day. So I have all these special sections, but basically it's alphabetical. Okay. Good to know. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Back to your book. <laughs> Okay, so so you really do encourage everyday reading in this new book. Oh, absolutely. And when people read this book, I really want them to be reminded of the pleasures of the reading life and why they enjoy reading and what makes it so special. Because when you're reading, it is something you can do for fun to get lost in a story, but also a book can take you places um, uh, geographically, across time and space, but a book can also take you deeply into other people's lives and experiences completely different from their own. And I really am reluctant to talk about reading like it's a vitamin because I think that it's absolutely good for you and amazing for building empathy and um, changing your worldview in really positive ways. But nobody ever wanted to pick up a book because it was good for them. But I do really want to remind people of the pleasures and also the power of reading. And the nicest thing I've heard, I just recorded a podcast with a bookstore owner in Connecticut yesterday. And she was saying the whole time I was reading, I was just smiling, just smiling. I felt so understood and I just related to it so much. And I thought Aww. that was really great. <laughs> That's so great. Okay. So I want to hear what are some of your, and I know this is going to be a hard question and you probably get asked it all the time, but I do want to hear like, some all-star books in your mind? Like what are some that really rise above the rest? For me. For you personally. Okay. And you can pick a few different genres. I mean, you've got freedom with this question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the space. I love Jane Austen, especially Pride and Prejudice and Emma. I love how they always hold up and they're always fresh and she's so funny and um, of her time, but so ahead of her time in so many ways. I just, they really sparkle. I love it. I am a big Wallace Stegner fan. I especially love Crossing to Safety. It's a favorite. Okay, me I too. Yeah, I've uh -huh. never heard anyone else mention him. That's so interesting because I don't know if you've ever read Danny Shapiro. She's a novelist and memoirist. I loved mm -hmm. Hourglass that is her last published book, but I was just at a booksellers conference and I was so excited to get an arc of her next book. That's an advanced review copy of her book coming out in January called Inheritance, which is um, a doozy of a story about a secret she discovered about her family when she was 54. And 
she tells this story about how she knew she had a lot in common with somebody because they both loved crossing the safety. And I saw that on the page and went, oh, that makes me so happy because I feel the same way. So I think there are more of us than you suspect. That was those Stegner was what we would take backpacking. And my husband and I, when we were first dating mm-hmm. and, and young married, we would read them to each other. We would read his books to each other when we were out in a tent. What's your favorite Stegner novel? Hmm. I'm trying to remember what this, there was one that I absolutely loved. And if you said the title, what was it? I'll think of it while we're talking. Um, but there was one in particular that I just loved, but, um, it's just, it's the kind of literature you love to be outdoors too, when you're reading. Mm, So mm -hmm. it really is. I mean, it was, um, those were really fond memories for us. Krista, we need to know this. I know. I'll about? think of it while we're okay, talking. I think okay. You keep telling suspects, your favorites and I'll keep, okay. what's that? I said, I think the usual suspects are probably Angle of Repose, Big Rock Candy Mountain. No. Nope. Spectator Berg. All the little live things. All the little live things. Yes. That, yes, that was it. <laughs> well, yes. that's a relief because that was really going to bother us both. Okay. I am so, I am so amazed too of, of your memory of how you remember. That's probably my, not my strength is remembering all the specific titles. That's really impressive. And that's part. Well, of why I don't know what day so- it is, but <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least I can remember the books. See, that's how my husband is. He mm-hmm. can, that is the same. Like he can remember those specifics. Mm-hmm. He would know it in a second. It's so crazy. Okay, go on. Well, what are more your Well, favorite? I love books like that, that are, that do what Steiner does in a way, which is take quiet moments and quiet lives and turn them into high drama and really make you feel the impact of everyday events, everyday relationships. I think his characters are so relatable in that way. And I really love that. This sounds so like literature class, but I do really like the way that he writes about um, the human condition and makes you see your own life and your own relationships a little bit different. So along those lines, I also really like um, Wendell Berry, a Kentucky author here, which is fun. And it was really great to hear how he's not just loved in Kentucky, but he's loved everywhere. And Marilyn Robinson, I think also writes very much along those lines. And a, I almost said contemporary those, those two authors are still writing, but I also like the much younger Emily St. John Mandel. Station Eleven is one of my favorite books I've read in the past five years. I just started a Wendell Berry on Audible. Um, see, I'm bad at titles. What, what, what is it? It's, okay. um, it's a very simple name. Anyway, I can look it up on my phone in a second. But um, He does a lot of those, the simple names. Mm-hmm. I mean, because that's what he does. He writes about very quiet, ordinary people and communities, but the way he writes about them, they, they don't feel ordinary. They seem really, really important, which I think really is the truth about so many of our lives. Maybe that is the truth about human life is that it feels really ordinary. And yet it also has this incredible weight to it. And I really like an author that can capture that on the page. Well, and isn't that his story that he was in academia and then he ended up coming back to his hometown and kind of finding yeah. meaning. In he that. and Wallace Stenger used to hang out in mm-hmm. California yeah. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah, before they went in different directions. And yeah, now he's back on the farm, mm-hmm. right, up, right up the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's called Carolina or oh, anyway, if you, if that, does that ring a bell, Carolina, little, no. The community in his Port William novels is based on Carrollton, Kentucky. That's approximate, approximately the geographical location. Mm-hmm. But it's Interesting. fictionalized. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So great. Um, so you do reading lists. How do you decide what goes on your reading list? I love doing these. So something that I really enjoy doing is taking, I don't know, a category and putting books on it that you might not expect, or you might not naturally think of going together and then drawing the parallels for readers or matching up books that don't seem on the surface to have a lot in common and pointing out like, no, these go beautifully together because they both have these through lines that aren't immediately apparent to everyone and uh, you couldn't really capture in an algorithm. I really enjoy doing that. Um, It depends. Most of the book lists on the blog are books I've read. This isn't true if um, we're going into 
like a new season, like maybe fall or winter. And I might share 20 books that I'm excited to read. I try to be very clear. I'm excited to read these. And if they're terrible, we can all be disappointed together, but I have (laughs) not read it yet. Right, right, right. Which is very different from summer reading where I read everything cover to cover, can speak about it. I try to be very clear on the blog. I have high hopes versus I have read this and I suspect you will like it if you're looking for this thing or that thing or that thing. I'm trying to share uh, two things really. I think for books that are... um, feel like they're widely read, that people know about them. Um, People just really love to know that other people are reading them, connect with other readers and have the experience of being like, oh, I'm in this big reading community that's really excited about the new Robert Galbraith. Are we supposed to call her JK Rowling now? Or the new Louise Penny that's coming out this November, or um, there's an Anne Lamott coming out in October that I'm awfully fond of, have read it, really enjoyed it. But I also am trying to connect readers with books that are perfect for them that they might not come across otherwise. So I'm trying to uncover um, books that you aren't seeing on every bookstore display or that aren't, you know, in the top 100 on some bestseller list, but might be the exact perfect book for you. And I try to write about them in a way that readers can recognize that, that they can really resonate with a description that says, if you love crossing the safety because of the way Steiner injects ordinary moments with great depth and has, you know, a certain pace and feel, then you may enjoy reading this specific book that you never heard of until this minute. Next. I feel like reading is so personal. Um, What I really enjoy reading may be completely different from what you enjoy reading. And we both happen to like crossing and safety, crossing the safety. But I know many readers who have read that and been like, eh, you know, it was okay. Three stars. It wasn't bad. And we can have very different reactions to the same book. Those same readers can say to me like, oh, have you read? I have a whole stack of books behind me that are things I picked up from the library because my fellow readers told me about them. They'll say like, uh, this was the best thing I've read all year, the best book of my life or the best in recent memory. And sometimes those just bore me to tears because reading is personal and we're looking for different things. And even in your own reading life, um, there's a right time for a book. There can be a wrong time for a book. So I could feel very differently about a book if I read it now versus six months from now versus six years from now. And remembering that reading is personal, I'm just always trying con- to connect readers with the right book for them. That's what I love about your book lists is that they are so varied. And so, I mean, you're bound to find something that is compelling. And I actually found one of my favorite nonfictions um, on one of your lists. I think it was the 2017 list. I think maybe it was 16, but um, The Power of Moments has Mm -hmm. become a very special book to me because Mm -hmm. it has changed. It's flipped something in my thinking about how to do life differently. And so for, that's just an example of a book I pulled off of one of your lists Mm -hmm. and then it ended up informing how I move forward with moments and how I'm creating moments in life. So I love the way your lists are in that way. I'm so glad to hear that. I personally really like that book. (laughs) I know it's, Mm -hmm. it really, and I, I talk about that book a lot because it, it just gives you that little pivot that helps you do things differently than you would have done it before um, or that you've done it in the past. And I think it really helps going forward, you know, to just create something special for your family or for your mm-hmm. community or for your friends or even for your business. Cause that's the whole thing is you can do this in your business too. The book really takes that. So anyway, I love your book list. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, Anne, tell us about how you got into podcasting and how this kind of parlayed from, you know, the blog and book lists and doing all this to a podcast and talk about your podcast. Well, I love podcasts and I've been listening for a really long time. I think back in 2002, a friend gave us a really nice gift and it was an iPod and I'd seen them advertised, but I thought, I don't. I don't know what to do with this thing. And then I discovered <laughs> podcasts and the way you downloaded them was really different then, but I've been, I've been listening for a really long time to podcasts, some of which are still around, which is just really funny to me because in internet years, that's like lifetimes, right. but it was really just 2002. Um, the first step was really the blog. So I started writing about books online in 2011. I didn't write about all books. I write about books a lot more now than I did or I ever imagined doing when I started. But 
several years into blogging, sometimes about books, I had this idea on a Sunday morning. I should probably go back. As I started blogging about books, I would start getting the same question from readers, um, either online or in my personal life, because they I started to be known as the book girl. Yeah. And they'd say, um, hey, can you, I need a book to read. What should I read? And I'd say, I don't know. What are you looking for? And they'd say, it's something great. Just tell me about a great book. And like we just said, reading is really personal. So I'd say, well, you know, to, what does that mean to you? Like, what's, what's something you really enjoyed? And they'd be kind of exasperated, like, Anne, I just want a great book. <laughs> I'd say, but I can't answer that without knowing some more about you and your reading life. So after reflecting on this for probably years, because I'm a really slow back burner processor, I like to let things simmer for a while or else I'm not going to have a clue what I think. I put up a post on a weekend morning and said, hey, I've been thinking about something. Let's try something. I probably received one more email or had one more coffee where a friend had said, hey, all I need is one great book. And I've been like, oh, not again. So <laughs> I put up a post and said, let's try something new. Leave me a blog comment. Tell me three books you love, one book you don't, and what you're reading now. And I'll recommend three titles you might enjoy reading next. And I answered these questions. Well, first of all, we had 200 comments by dinner time, And I thought, oh, wow. Okay. Right. This is not what I expected. I mean, it was a lot bigger reaction than I expected. And I started answering those comments and blog posts on the weekends and saying like, okay, this reader likes these books. This is what they don't like. I think I can see, this is my theory why, and these are the titles I recommend. But over time, I love this and I didn't like it at all because it was really fun. I love seeing um, what books went together. I was like, oh, I can totally see that. And what books the same reader would love that would make me go, this is, this is not what I expected. Um, but long story short, I love the concept, but I also longed for conversation. Email's not the same. Uh, meanwhile, podcasting was becoming much more accessible and possible for your average person at home with a computer and a microphone. And I thought that might be fun because I love to try new things. I love new projects, but I just don't have an idea. I didn't want to make the modern Mrs. Darcy show because I have a blog for that. And finally, at some point, a switch flipped and I realized that blog concept that I wished could be a conversation could be a conversation if I turned it into a podcast. And that is the story behind What Should I Read Next, which is now my weekly podcast on Tuesdays. Every week I talk to a reader who tells me it's the concept has never changed. They tell me three books they love, one book they don't, what they're reading now. We really dig into the why of how they choose what they choose and explore what resonates and what doesn't. And I recommend three books or sometimes more if I can't help myself, they may enjoy reading next. Do you get readers who want to be on the show? Like, how do you choose your guests for that? We have a submission form that's online. It's at what should I read next podcast.com slash guest. And the last I heard, we get about 10 submissions in a day. And there are only 52 Tuesdays in a year. And... <laughs> So we have more readers than we will ever be able to talk to. And I wish we could talk to everyone. But what we're looking for is over many weeks, we want to talk to a wide variety of readers of different ages and stages of life and gender and profession and race and culture and country and genre. And uh, we love it when we see books that have previously been um, disliked turn up in the love column and vice versa. Um, some people choose lifetime favorites. Some people limit themselves to the past year. We're just looking for a really interesting mix so that over time you will hear someone that where you think, oh, that sounds like me, or mm -hmm. I love that book too, for the same reason, so that you can like listen a little closer. But even if you don't hear your personal favorites in the loves, or the, some readers use the H word, they say they really genuinely hated a certain book for certain reasons. And they're entitled to their opinion. I just want to hear the reason why. But it's so interesting to hear how people connect with or don't to the books they read because uh, they're more than just books. Like this literature feels kind of pretentious, but like a good book really can strike a chord within you and your reaction or whether you love it or hate it can have um, very little to do with where the author is coming from, but everything to do with where you are right now in your life or where you've been. And in talking about books, it's so easy to talk about what really matters in life, 
which just makes it a really interesting conversation. Even if I've never heard of the books before, never intend to read them, the ones they're talking about. It's just you, it's talking about books is a shortcut to talking about the good stuff. It's true. It's, it goes back to the, the college classroom discussion, right? It's like you just get to talk, have these great deep conversations because that's what literature brings out. And what are some of your favorite nonfiction books? I'd like to hear what those are. Ooh, okay. That's a good question. I love, there's a readerly essay collection that's 15, 20 years old by Anne Fadiman. It's called Ex Libris, Confessions of a Common Reader. I took some of her words for the epigraph in I'd Rather Be Reading. Actually, I have a copy right here. I'm going to read it to you because this is the kind of person she is. Books wrote our life story and as they accumulated on our shelves and on our windowsills and underneath our sofa and on top of our refrigerator, they became chapters in it themselves. How could it be otherwise? So you can see why I really like Anne Fadiman, but she has this great essay collection where she writes about different aspects of the reading life. And she grew up in a home very different than mine in a different era. So her stories are completely different. But as a reader, I love to hear stories about the importance of books and reading in your life. So I love that. Um, I do love Danny Shapiro. I just finished Inheritance, which has me thinking I'm going to reread Hourglass, her most recently actually published book that's available in bookstores right now that I just loved. It's about time, memory, and marriage. And just how you were saying the power of moments really provided a paradigm shift for you. She writes about the way she views how her life has unfolded and how the significant relationships in her life have, um, and just how she's invested in them and viewed them through the years, how she had these just little pivots that caused her to think differently about those things. And I love a good book that can do that. On that note, I love two very nerdy books in a very specific way. Um, I love Walkable City by Jeff Speck. I'm an urban planning geek. I think I really enjoy seeing the, what's happening beneath the, like the structure, how the structure of things impacts the way we act, even if we don't realize it. In in Walkable City, he talks about how the way that our roads and our streets and our sidewalks are designed change the way we live in them. And I just think that's fascinating. I love that, which is also why I love the high cost of free parking. Totally nerdy. (laughs) totally nerdy. It's one of those textbooks that regular people read if they're giant nerds. And I love it so much because it explains how the world you live in works in these very specific ways that affect you every single day. Um, So I'll be reading and go, oh, that makes so much sense. And I never would have thought of that myself. Mm -hmm. And I love books that kind of show you hidden truths that affect you, but you've just been blind to. Totally. Yes, I do too. I think Alex would like those books because she lives in an urban environment. That would be really like it. Yeah. If you can walk to book four and then on a more spiritual note, um, the divine conspiracy by Dallas Willard is one of my lifetime favorites. I write about that and I'd rather be reading. That was the, that was a book that sat on my shelves for many, many years before I picked it up. And then when I picked it up, it happened to be, I didn't know this when I started it, but it was exactly the right book at exactly the right time. And I just have all the respect in the world for, for him and his work and his legacy. Yeah, me too. And I totally agree with you. Books find you at the right time. It could sit on your shelf forever, but then when you feel compelled to pick it up, I just had that recently with a book and you feel compelled to pick it up and it's just the exact timing. Mm -hmm. Like if you had read it two years ago when you got it, it wouldn't have had the same impact. So I love that. Yes, that, yes, that happens. And it is definitely one of the pleasures of the reading life. Mm -hmm. Because if you read, if, if you read, it will happen to you. Well, and I heard something once and tell me if you think this is true, that every time we read a book, we gain 10 years of wisdom because <laughs> I'm so old <laughs> well, I know because, by that measure, right? It's like, you're taking all the wisdom in this one area that this person has accumulated through their experience and through their age, whatever, you know, all mm-hmm. of their different education And then it transfers to you. And so every time you read a book, you gain, and I don't know if it's 10 years, that seems Mm -hmm. a little exaggerated Mm -hmm. to me, but I think the concept is that every time you read a book, you get to gain all that wisdom from someone else Mm -hmm. and then take that and make it a part of you and then move from that place. So I thought that was really cool. Would you say you agree with that? 
Oh, I agree that 10 years seems like a lot, but the concept I love and am completely on board with. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting. There are a number of politicians or business leaders who read, I don't know, like a book a day or a book a week, and they attribute that to their ability to lead because they're gaining knowledge from all of these experts instead of trying to do research themselves. They're depending on gain, gaining the knowledge from other people. So I, I'm always impressed when I hear that somebody reads a book a day or a book a week and they're running a Fortune 500 company or they're doing like a major job mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and yet they find that it's so valuable that they make it a priority. And then I always wonder too, that if they're fast readers, because they have to be if they're reading that much on top of other responsibilities. But Don't it speaks think to success, I think, and mm -hmm. to being able to, to gather the collective wisdom. And I would say too, I think it just makes me a more interesting person for the people I'm around. Like I think about our dinner table conversations and even just at my, with my own family, if I have something to bring to the table that's interesting that I've been reading about, then that's, that benefits all of us. I'm just more interesting instead of just, oh yeah, well today, you know, here's what I did. You know, I did some podcasts, I did some dishes, I walked the dog, you know, I mean, kind of the same stuff over and over, right? Which is a part of my daily life. But if I have something to add, it just makes it so much more fun. So I like, and also as conversations come up and Anne, I don't know if you find this, but you can help people too, because like I'm reading a book, for example, on connecting with teenagers right now. Mm -hmm. Well, several times in conversations, people have said things. I'm like, well, this book that I'm reading says this about that. And that really benefits them and helps. It makes me a better friend. Do you find that too? Well, your example is very interesting because there's a book about teenage girls that I really love called Untangled. And I have had that conversation this week on the sports sidelines of one of my friends saying, oh, let me tell you about what happened at home and me saying, well, let me tell you this thing. And I think when you're talking about reading a book, it allows you to be a, a connector instead of a bossy know-it-all. <laughs> and because that lets me say like, oh my gosh, yes, I hear exactly what you're saying. I, they're currently reading a book about this very issue for the third time because I need it. And I just really wish I could download it into my brain. But unfortunately that technology is not available yet, but this is, this is what I was reading. And they'll be like, wait, I need this. What's it called? Help me. Totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's, there are certainly other topics. I like to discuss out of reading, but just your example is really interesting. And I think as a reader, I love any moment where I have to dog ear the page. I'm, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. I'm a dog ear, uh, <laughs> but only if it's my book, I never do it to other people's other libraries, but any moment where I come to, I'm like, oh, I've got to save this for later. Cause I need to share this with, you know, my husband, my kids, a certain person, like any passage in a book that makes you feel compelled to share it because it's just that interesting or poignant or applicable to what you're going through right now is um, so wonderful. Anything that demands to be shared is uh, really something special. Mm -hmm. Well, Anne, thank you. This has been so awesome. We like to end our interviews with a couple of questions just about your personal life. Okay. So you ready for these? I'm what ready. Okay. What are some things that you use every day that you couldn't live without? That's not like coffee or, you know, but just <laughs> like the things that you really like use. Mm -hmm. That make your life work well. Mm -hmm. Good pens. Pencils. You have a certain one. I rotate. I don't have like a lifetime favorite, but I'll have a brand I'm partial to for now. So in the past, they've been Papermate Flares or Stettler Fine Liners. Right now, Sharpie pens have my, they're, they're the ones where if I don't have one in my purse, I'll go rummaging about the house to see which kid stole it and left it where. Right. Post-it notes, post-it notes and index cards. I'm very visual. I'm not great at organizing. So getting it on paper in a way that I can move the pieces around really helps me. Also my water bottle because I've never been a water bottle user until this year. I'm not sure what happened and limes, lemons, or those little true lemon packets, because that way I will actually drink said water. Mm -hmm. 
Do you use the glass ones? I do. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a glass one with like a silicone sleeve so that it, it's a little bit grippy and I don't know why I love it so much. I just know that it really works for me. (laughs) You find what works. I know. I don't want to reason why. (laughs) It really did. It just showed up on my doorstep without me ordering it. Mm -hmm. Somebody knew. Okay. What about, um, a favorite tradition? Ooh, okay. So my anniversary was in June and it's not June anymore, but my husband and I got married here in Louisville and we got our wedding cake from a local baker who is still in business. So every year, unless, except for those like bumpy gluten-free dairy for years, when we had some major food sensitivities in my house, <laughs> every year we go to the baker and we get some of the cake that we had at our wedding and we have it as a family. So of course the kids love this and you know, it's cheap. It's fun. It's indulgent. It's nostalgic. That's so it cute. I've never heard of that one. That's really darling. We just need an excuse to eat cake. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a, a special flavor? Oh, well, we had three. So we had Italian cream, which is almost always in the bakery case, chocolate raspberry, which sometimes is, and I kind of prefer because I have kind of an iffy relationship with coconut and mm-hmm. in that kind of texture thing. I like my coconut crispy. And we had carrot cake. So we so really have an excuse to get all the cake if our, mm-hmm. if our anniversary falls on the day of the week where all the cake is in the case at the same time. So 18 years of good cake. It's, that's a good tradition. We think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then uh, favorite recipes. Yes. There is a mostly flourless chocolate cake that I tweaked slightly from a book. The book is A Homemade Life. It's by Molly Weisenberg. It's a really wonderful food memoir. It's so sad when it starts because what happens is her father dies and she's really close to her dad. So you are going to need the tissues if you pick this up for the first 60 pages or so. But then not knowing what to do with herself after her dad dies, she goes to Paris and she falls in love and she cooks a whole lot of food. Um, At the end of the book, she, I I almost gave a spoiler that probably the whole world knows if you follow her on the internet, but if you're just picking up this book in a vacuum, I don't want to, I don't want to do that, but there's a flourless chocolate cake. Well, there's one tablespoon of flour, which I usually make with almond meal now because we're allergic to, well, for a while we're allergic to gluten, but I don't mean allergic. I mean, intolerant of right. Those are different <laughs> things. And for the people who have the genuine allergies, my heart goes out to you because the sensitivities are hard enough to deal with and the consequences aren't nearly as bad, but I can make it from memory. I always have the ingredients on hand. It's super simple. It's easy to serve. It looks pretty. You just make it in a sheet pan, like a nine inch, not a, that's not a sheet pan, just a cake pan, a nine inch round cake pan. You dust it with powdered sugar, fresh raspberries are totally over the top or whipped cream, but you don't need it. It's simple not terribly expensive, totally indulgent, but also so easy. I think I said simple and easy twice. It totally I love it. <laughs> it. Well, you okay. know, I have a funny story about that book. My mom was reading it and she mm-hmm. said, I don't know why she wrote this book. Like she thought people would be interested in reading this story of her life. And I'm like, mom, you're reading it. So you are interested. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, she, so she's a, it's a big book. I, I mean, I've really only heard of it from my mom. So you're saying that people follow her on the internet now. She's, is it a popular book? She had a blog before she had a book. Okay. She, she wrote for Bon Appetit actually forever and ever ago. And I don't know what came first, the blog or Jet or Bon Appetit, but she's been a food writer for a really long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's well, still selling. Sounds good. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Any other like go-to recipes that you love for your family? Yes. So in the new Smitten Kitchen cookbook, I love her Smitten Kitchen every day. She has a recipe for street pan. No, street pan. I just combined two things. We make a sheet pan chicken, but we also make street cart chicken and rice. And everybody likes it in my family. There are six of us. It's kind of a miracle. Um, it's, It's simple, but there are sauces and fixings and it can be customized in such a way that it's not boring. And it's not fussy, but it's really good. And it does seem like you tried, even though you didn't have to try very hard. Right. And I really love recipes like that. So it's the kind of thing we could have on a Tuesday night for dinner, but we've also made it so much when we have friends over it that my kids have said, are you making streetcar chicken again? And I'm like, I was thinking about it. Why do you ask? <laughs> Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Because <laughs> if not, I'll make that other thing I always make. Right. When we have people over. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Well, thank you, Anne. Those are so fun. And we absolutely have loved talking to you. Thank you for the work you do in the world. It is really rich and benefits all of us. So thank you. Well, that's so kind. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.